This module is on the stuff of genes, DNA as the genetic material. So first, let's recall Griffith's discovery of bacterial transformation in the 1920s. You may recall that Griffith was actually looking for a way to produce a vaccine against the pneumonia that killed off many people during the influenza epidemic of 1918. So he was actually studying not influenza, which is of course a virus, but the Streptococcus pneumonia bacterium that killed people during that epidemic. So here we have the wild type strain of Streptococcus pneumonia called the S strain. The S uh, refers to the smooth appearance of colonies on agar plates. And when these bacteria were injected into a mouse, the mouse would die within a day or so. There was a mutant strain called the R strain of S pneumonia. The R stands for rough because the colonies that were produced would have a rough appearance. When these were injected into the mouse, the mouse survived. What Griffith attempted to do was to produce a vaccine by immunizing mice. And the first thing he did was to inject the S strain after it had been heated to kill the actual bacteria. And sure enough, the mouse survived the injection uh, and was quite alive and healthy after 24 hours. If that mouse were re-injected with living wild-type S-strain bacteria, they died in a day. So, in fact, no immunity was achieved. The R-strain and the heat-killed S-strain were injected together. Griffith reasoned that perhaps something from the R-strain would combine with something from the heat-killed virulent strain to perhaps confer immunity. Surprisingly, though either alone, the R-strain or the heat-killed S-strain, didn't affect the mice, when he injected both together, the mouse died within a day or so. And what's more, the blood of the dead mouse contained nothing more than living S strain. In other words, you could take the blood of the dead mouse, plate it on an agar plate, and grow smooth colony virulent cells. And you knew they were virulent because you could re-inject such bacteria into a fresh mouse and the mouse would die. What Griffith concluded was that the rough living strain of the cell was being genetically transformed by something from the heat killed S strain. Avery, McLeod, and McCarty actually identified what came to be called the transforming principle, that molecule which causes the genetic transformation. So what they did was they purified DNA from virulent cells, mixed them in a tube with non-virulent R cells, waited for a time, and then took the resulting cells and injected them into a mouse, and lo and behold, the mouse died. From which you might conclude that DNA from virulent cells was the transforming principle. In fact, you could take cells out of that dead mouse and grow them on agar, as I indicated before. The convincing thing, of course, was that when they purified either protein or lipids or RNA or carbohydrates separately from the, the heat-killed S-cell mixture and tried to do the same experiment, adding those in turn to non-virulent R cells, they had no effect. The mouse then would survive a subsequent injection. So Avery and company uh, concluded that the DNA from the S cells was the transforming principle. DNA for many years was thought to be a very simple molecule. At the turn of the 20th century, when it had first been discovered chemically, it was known that it was composed of the four different nucleotides, but at first people thought that it was in fact just a tetranucleotide, you know, AGCT or ACGT. There were 256 combinations of A, G, C, and T that one could create in terms of the order of the bases. It, was, it would be hard to explain all the genetic differences within an organism, never mind across organisms, by just 256 different sequences of bases in DNA. Uh, over the next several decades, it became clear that DNA was not just a tetramer, but was in fact quite a long or quite a large macromolecule. Nevertheless, it was difficult to conceive of even a large molecule consisting of just four individual monomers, A, C, G, and T. It was hard to conceive of that as, as encoding the necessary genetic information to make a whole cell or a whole individual. So for many years, people thought it must be protein that contain genetic information. No, proteins must be the stuff of genes. Why? Because proteins were made up of 20 amino acids, and it had become clear in the 20s, 30s, and 40s that different proteins can have very, very different combinations of those 20 amino acids. So structurally, proteins could be much more diverse, and we've already seen that they, in fact, are quite diverse. So there was a bias that proteins were the genes, not DNA. 
people thought perhaps the DNA was a kind of skeletal framework in the nucleus on which the genes would be hung. That was the idea.